Good evening and welcome to the February 17th regular meeting of council. Looks like we have a fairly full meeting this evening. We've got uh, three delegations and a number of items to discuss. So I'm going to be asking those who are presenting this evening to try and make sure to keep uh, your presentations within the uh, usual 10 minutes allocated. We also want to leave some room for council to discuss. And let's get this uh, meeting under order. And the first up is the adoption of the minutes of the council meeting held February 3rd, 2014. Do we have a mover and a second? A move by Councillor Lefebvre, seconded by Councillor Powell. Are there any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Now moving to approval of the agenda, and I need once again a motion that the February 17th, 2014 Council meeting agenda be approved. Moved by Councillor Paul Davidson, seconded by Councillor Neufeld. Again, any errors, submissions, additions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. All right, moving right into our delegations phase. We do have three delegations this evening. First up, we have the Bellina Secondary School Dry Grad 2014 Graduation Prom Parade, and this is a presentation by graduating Bellina Secondary School students. Looking around, now who here looks like a student? Well, there you are. All right, young man, have a seat. There's a button there, yeah, you know it. Nope, you just press it once and make sure that red light's on. It may turn off on you, so try and pay attention to it. Perfect. Take a deep breath relax, which is parents, neighbors, right? And uh, maybe start with your name and the floor is yours. Um, so I am Dane Sabo and I'm the uh, class grad president uh, for Bellinas of the graduating class 2014. Um, and today I was just wanted to talk about the our application for our parade route. Um, so the parade route would start at Springwood Middle School onto Despard. Um, it would take a left onto Mollyette, um, a right onto Jensen Avenue, and go directly to Parksville Community and Conference Center into the front entrance. Um, and that would be on Saturday, June 20, 28th from 4 to 6 p.m. Um, our parade chair had a meeting with Constable George Minchel. Um, Citizens on Patrol members John Bishop and Michael Garland on Monday, February 3rd, 2014, to discuss par the parade route. Um, we received an email from Constable Minchel on February 12th with approval for our parade route, assuming the City of Parksville approves our application. Um, they will provide three officers um, th in three police vehicles to assist during the parade. Citizens on patrol will provide additional personnel to man the barricades located along the route. Um, our parade chair, Jillian Moore, will hand out flyers with parade information to every residence on Jensen Avenue the week before our parade to notify them. Um, and our parade route information will be put in the local newspaper through communications officer Debbie Tardiff. Um, our parade chair spoke to Chris at School District 69 uh, busing office. Cost of busing students from Bellinas to Parksville Community and Conference is about $400. Um, the new route will eliminate this cost to our fundraising committee, um, which would be a huge help. Um, parking for parade and red carpet viewers can happen in gravel lots on Craig and Jensen. And the Bellinas Dry Grad Prom Parade has been a tradition in our city since approximately 1998. Um, and we hope that the community will come out to watch our parade and share in the excitement of our grad class of 2014. Um, and on, the grad on behalf of the grad class of 2014 and the Dry Grad Prom Committee, uh, we want to thank you for allowing us to appear before the City Council. All right. Thank you, Mr. President. And gold star to you for staying well within that 10-minute allocation. I'm just going to ask you to stay there for one second. I'm just going to open up the floor to any members of council that may have some comments or questions. Councillor Paul Davids. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, very well presented. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just have a question for you. I, I heard all the people that you said you were um, in contact with. Had you connected with the fire chief to ensure that the, the road closures that you're proposing wouldn't impede any emergency vehicles? Um, no, we haven't. Follow up, Your Worship? Go ahead. Through you to the fire chief? Okay. Do you see any problems with that, Chief? Uh, Your Worship, through to Councillor Paul Davidson, no, I, I don't see any problems with We'll probably have a crew around the hall, because the parade route will be going 
right in front of the hall. So if we have to uh, get out, we've got most lights and sirens. So. I also did see, for those that might not be able to see at home, uh, an indication from the delegation that came along with this gentleman nodding that they would certainly talk with our chief. Any further members of council have any questions or comments? Okay, very good. I think your request is in our agenda this evening, and we'll be getting to that, I think, fairly quickly. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving along, ladies and gentlemen, we have our next pre uh, presentation, or delegation rather, and that is from Dr. Paul Hasselback, and he's our Island Health Medical Officer, and he's here to speak about health at the local level. Good to see you again, Doctor. As always, Your Worship, it's good to be back, and uh, thank you for indulging me once again. I know I cannot beat that presentation, uh, but I shall endeavor to do my best to keep you entertained and informed over the next few minutes. Very good, the floor um, is yours. And to your worship, members of council, members of the administration, thank you again for uh, uh, having me come by and sort of bring you up to date where things are. Uh, I try once a year to get out to the 14 local governments in the central island, and uh, this year you have the pleasure of being number one. So I apologize it's not quite as smooth as it might be, and I shall learn and happy to take your comments back and try to improve it for your colleagues. Um, this year... Uh, with the census and the National Household Survey information was released, uh, and that provides us with some differences. There's also some other differences. So in the presentation that's up here, you have your local health area, which is that geographic zone that um, information tends to be clustered around. Uh, those boundaries include up to Qualcomm Beach and uh, down just north of Lanceville. Uh, and include large sections of the regional district as well. Extracting community-specific information becomes a bit challenging. The one advantage of the National Houth Household Survey is it does provide an opportunity to begin to look at community-specific information. Uh, regrettably, we don't have the same uh, coterminous boundaries. And uh, just looking at uh, School District 69, uh, the uh, we've presented in the past the Early Development Index. Uh, the folks that pr undertake that study every couple of years have gone and changed the geographic zoning around uh, uh, how they cluster together those children. That's got impacts because we were very much celebrating the successes occurring in Parksville. And I've got some information that I need to share with you about uh, uh, less than progress in the last little while. Um, the census divides up uh, so that there are two geographic zones that are available to the Parksville community. Uh, the census metropolitan area, which I've got identified there, um, I'm not quite sure how that bounds out compared to the city boundaries. Uh, and the census subdivision, which is a, a subcomponent. And I, again, I'm not going to speak to how the census actually determines uh, how these geographic boundaries are out there, but as you look at information, you will see a variety of different clustering of geographic data, uh, all of which may be relevant, and as you can appreciate the challenge of trying to present that so that you're actually looking at uh, the geography over which this council has responsibility, even though I know you're interested in improving the well-being for those that uh, are your neighbors as well. Um, Parksville has, for many years, had a slightly longer life expectancy uh, through the Qualcomm LHA, so this is up to the Bowser area. Um, as the data get melded over five years, we're beginning to see that the life expectancy in this area is now approximating the same as that of BC and the same as that of the island. I'm not sure I could overinterpret that in any fashion. It's just that I can no longer say that this is the healthiest lo local health area in the Central Island is just as good as everybody else. Uh, what we've presented in the past, and I know you're very familiar with, is this demographic profile where the population of a local health area is in red and peaks around the ages of 65 to 69 uh, with a real trough in the 25 to 39 age group. 
Uh, in the background, you will see the island in green and BC in the dotted blue. And not surprisingly to this council, the, the general age of the population living in the Parksville, Qualicum area, tends to be significantly older than um, most of the rest of the island. And in fact, is one of the more elderly local health areas in the province. I believe they are number two at the moment. Um, it is election year, and I'm sure none of you recognize that. Uh, I did want to have the opportunity to celebrate some of the successes of this particular council in improving the well-being of residents of this community, not the least of which is the opening of the Oceanside Health Center and the opening of Family Place, both of which have occurred during your tenure. Uh, certainly, uh, Councillor Lefebvre is uh, ably representing this council in the establishment of uh, trying to develop an Oceanside Health and Social Planning Working Group. Uh, call that a network if you wish, but uh, that's something that is under progress and hopefully, and I trust Councillor Lefebvre is keeping you well aware, his activities are greatly appreciated. Uh, there have been other successes in terms of the establishment of the development of family practice to provide a cohesive primary care voice for the integrated uh, uh, health activities. And I certainly don't want to suggest that I'm aware of everything that this council has succeeded in doing in the last few years and leave it to you to uh, fill this out if you wish. Um, over the final few minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about the LHA profiles. Um, they are accessible online. Uh, Let me just stop you there for a second, Dr. Yep. Hasselbeck. Thanks to the brevity of our first presentation, you can go a little over time given the importance of the document, so don't feel too rushed. I don't um, think Council would object. No. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, thank you for that, Your Worship. I actually will try to stick to the time because I do have to do this 14 times. And some other councils are not as forgiving as you may be, and I do appreciate that. <laughs> uh, the profiles should be online. Um, you're privileged to actually see data that is not yet out there. Uh, it is supposed to be posted by now, but uh, in this day and age, things tend to slip in terms of the time frames. I've been advised that they should be posted by the end of the month, so hopefully they're out there. Uh, and certainly, if any of council members actually want the profile, uh, I'm happy to share that with you uh, when I get the final copy. Um, I do present it for your benefit in such a fashion that anything that looks to that side or to the right is good, and to that side and to the left is not quite so good. Uh, we have three years of data presented here, uh, red being the most recent year, and so subsequently you can look back at previous years uh, and you'll see how uh, some statistics cluster in a similar direction and others seem to vary from year to year. National Household Survey, or census, as it used to be known, was released last year in the fall. Um, and has various different groupings that I've mentioned too. What you should be aware of is that the non-response rate for the Parksville area is about 23%. Uh, in past years, the non-response rate for the long form of the census was somewhere between 3 and 7%. That's a fairly significant bias in terms of the data. Most disconcerting, what seems to be underrepresented are lower socioeconomic groups, uh, single parent families. I've seen reductions in lone parent family leadership by 50% just by the statistical uh, anomaly of how the uh, survey was undertaken. Underrepresentation of Aboriginal peoples, which is a long-standing issue in the census, and likely underrepresentation of other ethnic groups, specifically because of who uh, undertook and completes the survey, compared to those that um, might have appreciated a little bit more assistance, um, which wasn't available to them in 2011. Uh, I presented both the census metropolitan area and the census subdivision information for you. You will see they are very comparable. Obviously, the geographic areas overlap considerably as well. And I'm just going to give you a smattering of some of the statistics uh, here. Uh, and again, to the right is reasonably good. So uh, measures on birth statistics, uh, statistics here, such as the health of the baby, tend to be reasonably good in the Qualicum LHA. On the other hand, the birth rate is significantly lower than what we see in other parts of the island uh, and in BC. And again, that would not be a surprise to this council. Uh, 
many of the child health indicators are better than what we see uh, elsewhere on the island or elsewhere in the province. Um, when you look at something like infant mortality, which seems to vary widely, that may be the difference of one uh, incident per year. And so it's actually a very small number, but infant mortality over many years is a reasonably good indicator for us as that of the health of babies. I, I just hope this is not a trend we're going to be looking at. And again, if we look at the healthy development of our youth, this tends to be more to the right-hand side, and which is tend to be good, and all this is good information, uh, at least signs of good, healthy community. Um, if we look at issues like income assistance and some of our economic indicators, not surprisingly, again to this council, uh, this particular local health area and census area tend to do better than some of their comparator communities within the island and in, in, in British Columbia. Um, because of a relatively increased life expectancy, there are lots of things that the death rates or mortality rates in the area are better than what we see on the island. But I do spread this over two slides the poorer ones being on the second slide, and what is somewhat increased and uh, reflective of what happens in some rural areas are the motor vehicle collisions, uh, which is the second from the bottom. I do not have an explanation for the bottom on this, which is pneumonia and influenza. Uh, that's mostly pneumonia. Uh, but I do put a challenge out to councils that since we know motor vehicle crashes are a significant cause of death amongst um, individuals living in more rural environments, uh, there are some better practices beginning to occur about clustering those involved in transportation around from seeing what can be done about reducing motor vehicle crash deaths uh, and with significant successes in some jurisdictions. Um, jumping to the National Health Household Survey, these do not have comparators at this point in time. The local health area information will not be released to us. Um, and so when I come back next year, I may be able to make a comparison between Parksville and the local health area to start putting some of the Parksville specific statistics into um, uh, context. And so we, you know, we'll need to look forward to that. Uh, I don't have a date when that data file will become available to us. We actually have to ask Statistics Canada to do a special run in the province of British Columbia to have the data so that we can make it comparable to how we collect the rest of our data. Um, and again, I'm just picking on, oh, sorry, please, Councillor. Go ahead, Councillor Paul Davidson. Yeah, I take it you had a question. Oh, just some clarification on that previous slide. Can you explain the difference between adults living alone and singles? You know, I actually can't. I'd have to go back to the definitions uh, as to how they're presented. Okay. Um, there is better information becoming available on the quality of housing available within various different communities. And again, without comparators, this is really difficult data to look at this point in time. Uh, and unfortunately, I can only present it to you in terms of the raw information at the moment. Uh, home ownership rates on the island uh, north of the Malahat tend to actually be much higher than we see in the rest of the uh, south of the Malahat, uh, or in comparison to uh, BC as a whole, mostly because we have such large, uh, challenging for in terms of affordability markets in Victoria and Vancouver, um, and so that there is a real benefit to rural and somewhat more remote community living in terms of much higher own home ownership rates. Uh, so my final bit of data here is what I alluded to previously, that at six-year-old kindergarten, um, every two years, the uh, Human Early Learning Partnership undertakes in conjunction with the school districts an, an assessment of the uh, um, preparedness of children for school. Uh, the terminology they use is vulnerability, and we our hope had been to drive vulnerability on any of the scales down below 15% by the year 2015. Uh, what we've seen in 2011-13, not just in the Parksville area, but in many areas across the province, is a 
increase rather than a decrease in um, vulnerabilities, uh, suggesting that despite some of our efforts out there and despite some of our rhetoric out there, we're not investing it uh, in children to the same extent that perhaps was occurring previously, and we're beginning to see some of those problems. And uh, I'll sit here and tell you that I'm actually not surprised. Uh, Parksville is flag in red here. In the past, that had been a, a very significant downhill trend, something I was not seeing in other jurisdictions. Uh, unfortunately, it has slipped back up, and some of that may have to do with the geographic uh, boundaries that uh, HELP now uses for the Parksville area. And with that, Your Worship and members of Council, thank you very much. Uh, happy to answer any of your questions, and uh, should you wish to explore much deeper into this, uh, I am prepared to come back at, uh, at a time that's more convenient for you, and at a time length that's more convenient for you. Very good. Thank you, Doctor. So I will open the floor to members of Council. I see a few hands up. I'll go ahead with Councillor Newfeld first, then Councillor Lefebvre. Thanks very much, Your Worship, and thanks very much, Dr. Hasselbeck. Uh, fascinating. I mean, you, you flew through some of those slides that I, I, I wanted to uh, ask questions on. Uh, as far as the motor vehicles, uh, with respect to deaths, uh, uh, can, can you, you, there's no attribution as to what uh, might be causing uh, uh, that, sp that spur or that spurt of as far as uh, deaths are concerned. Uh, do, do you get into uh, speed? Do you get into issues of, of uh, why it's occurring? Uh, uh, can you um, elucidate? Um, absolutely, Councillor Newfeld. There's actually a medical health officer report, which again I know is completed. I've seen it. I can share it with you, but it's not the last time I looked actually up online. Um, if you get a hold of me, though, I will give you a link so that you can look at it, which has detailed out some of this. What we do tend to know is that um, people who live in more rural areas, and uh, you know, anything north of the Malahat is considered rural. Um, that uh, we tend to travel further by vehicle, we tend to travel further faster by vehicle, and those two risk factors are the most significant risk factors for motor vehicle crashes. Um, th that we're in our vehicles and we're going a distance at speeds, assuming legal speeds, <laughs> that are higher than what will occur for most people living in an urban setting is why we often see the increase. A quick follow-up, and then yeah, we'll if you would please, Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, your, your Worship. There, actually, there are a whole slew of questions. You answered one of them already, sir. Uh, I, I actually would like to have a hard copy, and I would like to have further discussion with you uh, concerning it, and I'm sure the rest of Council might as well. Uh, but the second question was with respect to uh, home ownership. It was really quite significant. What your slide showed was that um, uh, the cost for uh, an owner of a piece of property, a uh, homeowner, would be $800 as opposed to a renter would be up at 950 or something of that nature. So really, it, it, although we're not responsible as, as uh, you know, our level of government for, uh, for housing, in fact, um, we should be pushing the, the federal government, the provincial government, for uh, housing and for assistance in housing, uh, uh, you know, to be able to put people into uh, their own home uh, and, and to make that a more affordable um, uh, uh, way of doing things, just to be able to allow for uh, greater, I guess, a, a greater use of, a greater efficient use of uh, income that they might have. Uh, is this something that you would agree with, or, or how would you uh, follow that, sir? I really enjoy when I get questions of that nature that actually have their answer in them, and Councillor Neufeld, I totally agree with what you just said. Um, housing is a grossly underrated concern when it comes to health issues. We know that people who actually have their own home, um, be it a rental or be it a, their own home, uh, but some stable housing environment, stable housing environment is one of the best contributors to their long-term well-being. Uh, we, it's one of the few things that I actually could commend the federal government for in its last um, speech from the throne because they actually did speak to the need for uh, increasing housing strategy for those that are in unstable housing environments. But at a local level, I do think there's lots that you can do in terms of your uh, community planning relative to supporting the development of both types of housing markets uh, and some comparability between those markets. Thank you. Councillor Lefebvre. Thank you, Worship, and thank you, Dr. Hasselbeck, for your presentation. I wanted to come back to the, uh, by the way, is there any cure for the common cold yet? 
Not that no? I'm aware okay. of. Okay. Well, if, uh, I thought I'd ask that question first. Uh, uh, in your statistics, you showed that 22% uh, non-response rate among, amongst uh, the group that you showed there. Uh, I gather that that's got a lot to do as poverty related, poverty related and, and bringing up some of the issues that are uh, that are of concern. I mean, non-response, that, that can't be good. That, it must augur for other problems that are going to come uh, come about. So, Councillor Lefebvre, um, the prior to 2011, the long-form census uh, was a mandatory requirement. Um, sometime between 2006 and 2011, there was a decision that was made that that would no longer be mandatory but would be voluntary. Um, there were significant concerns expressed by a whole wide range of organizations, including local governments, about what that would probably do to the data from the National Household Survey. Uh, I think that all we've been able to accomplish is to confirm that those fears were brought forward. Uh, that in the absence of truly being able to break down who did not reply to the survey, and we don't have the information on that, we can make some um, acknowledgements based on what we know from other data. Uh, such as past surveys, when lone parent rates drop by 50%, that's a prime example of one that you know that just didn't happen. Um, and uh, there are other reasons why we can make suppositions and con some conclusions about who isn't replying. How that impacts the results of the National Household Survey, however, is something that we actually do not have an answer to. And when you go to Statistics Canada, you will see this disclaimer on all the information that they have uh, about the results of the National Household Survey. Thank you, and I hope that uh, we can get together for a longer period of time because it was a lot of information. We could spend, I think, a few hours with you, but maybe we can come back at another time like we've done in the past. Yes, we have done that in the past. As other members of council feel that might be worthwhile? Not seeing anyone object, so perhaps our staff will contact <coughs> yours and we'll make an arrangement and we can get you exclusively on an evening or something. Thank you very much, Your Worship, members of Council and Administration. It's a pleasure being able to join you this evening, and I will look forward to coming back and having more in-depth. And please don't hesitate to contact me if you need some additional information. All right. Thank you, Doctor. All right, so while we're passing something along in a brown paper bag, we'll move on to the next delegation, ladies and gentlemen, and that is from Adventure Sea Kayaking. It's a report on the use of the hovercraft site, 2013, and it's a presentation by Jan Kretz of said company. Hello, Ms. Kretz, how are you this evening? Hello, Your Worship and members of council. Uh, my name, yes, is Jan Kretz, and I'm the owner of Adventure Sea Kayaking, and last year I was granted the uh, contract to run my kayaking company out of the former hovercraft site down at Parksville Community Beach. So um, when the city asked me whether um, something feasible or something I wanted to do again, I thought I would write a report. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually had a chance to read it, but there was a uh, fairly challenging uh, to... Um, the logistics of it and um, the signage and just getting people to my end of the beach where I was. So I did get um, two directional signs uh, made. The city was very good on that. It was, it was great. And the other one, of course, was getting people to my end of the beach. Um, mostly what I saw was a lot of other people having signage within the beach, um, which is what I would like to address tonight, um, whether they were people having yoga on the beach or it was the... Uh, Beach Fest or the Sandcastle weekend. Um, <clears throat> so I would just, I did, um, when I did see other people do that, I did um, make a uh, sign like this, and I did put them in the park about the third week in August, and they're just um, directional signs that would take people right from when you enter the beach uh, around the corner and down the way to the end. So I was just hoping that we could somehow have, I could have directional signs within the park itself, as other people are using. And the other thing um, was that the labyrinth was painted over the hovercraft site, and um, 
I did agree to this, but it wasn't going to happen until September, which I figured would be sort of at the end of the season, but it actually happened first week in August. So what happened there is that they actually took over the site and um, it was quite a successful thing for the people walking the labyrinth, but unfortunately I couldn't really put my pop-up tent there anymore or um, I felt like I was intruding upon their space even though I had rented the space. So a little bit of, um, I would like to go down to the beach again this year, but I, I, and that part of the beach is probably the best to run the kayaking out of, but I'll have to look at the location there. And the last thing was, of course, there is a big buildup of a gravel bar right in front of the ramp. And I'm just wondering whether it would be possible to have that removed, um, whether a, some kind of grader or something could go in there. I know that the uh, city of, of Qualicum Beach actually goes in and um, moves their sand that come in through the tides and things like that. So just was wondering uh, if that was possible to make this. Um, feasible business to run down there. Does that conclude your presentation, Ms. Yes. Fred? Okay, just uh, for the record, um, this is the information package that you provided, and I yes. believe it's been distributed to all members of council. I certainly read it, and you do make a number of uh, suggestions inside. Uh, I'll open the floor to members of council. I presume you've all read that report as well, and uh, are there any questions for Ms. Kratz? So I see one starting on the left here with Councillor Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I did have a read through uh, this. So are you asking for um, uh, Council just to allow you to have those uh, directional signs? You're not asking Council to, to put up more of the, the actual street signs to reflect, or reflect uh, the street no, signs? No, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, uh, the only other uh, question I would have uh, would be more for staff on the uh, what impact that would have. I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't been down to that end of the beach in a while, what the gravel bar is. Um, I certainly one, wouldn't want to impact, uh, I don't know, we've had issues in the past with the, the rocks and the amount of the, uh, uh, the gravel that's there that's actually uh, stopping the erosion of that uh, point. So um, I don't know whether staff uh, would have any impact, input on that. One option for council, because actually this report goes into much greater detail and, and you talk about a number of different things that we haven't had opportunity to actually discuss tonight. One option would be to uh, refer to staff to come back at the next meeting with some options or red flags or whatever the case may be. But uh, I just wanted to ask perhaps our Director of Community Planning real quick. I believe we are due for a sign review, a sign bylaw review that's coming up fairly soon. If I may, Worship, we are presently reviewing it, correct? All right, so uh, does that conclude your questions, Councillor Morrison? So we'll move to Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship, and um, thanks, Jan, for coming. I, I agree with you. You can't run a business without signs, and I think I attempted to do something for you last year, but it never happened. And, but you did end up having some signs because you saw the other signs there, so you put them out. And, and did it help immediately? I think it did, but it was towards the end of the season. Like, yeah. I seemed to be the only one playing by the rules, and then I thought, well, this is crazy. Yeah. So, that, and, and the reason I did this is because these were the city-approved signs, and so they weren't so much advertising. They were just uh, directing people to the yeah. hovercraft site. Well, you certainly need some signage if you're going to run a business, and we're going to rent you the space. We should allow you to do that. Anyways, I guess they're going to review it, and hopefully they'll review it before the season starts. The sandbar you're talking about, though, I wasn't quite sure. That, you're not talking about the large one out in front, are you? Yeah, that, the that big uh, gravel bar that stops the tide from coming in right yeah. off the paved uh, hovercraft site and the ramp there. So it just keeps... Yeah. At, at one time, they used to come and take that away. Yes. But they haven't done that now for a number of years. But uh, I, I, I don't know what effect that would have if we took it away. It might change the beach somehow but uh. I um, from what I um, heard uh, it didn't used to be there and then something happened and all of a sudden I don't know whether it had to do with the RV park and then it started to build up yeah. and so what it does is it keeps the tide away from there yeah. and it um, you know not only for myself but like for people who want to swim and everything yeah. because of that end is is the least tide but it's still we just you know, we couldn't really run the business until mid-afternoon because that's when the tides would come in. But if that was not there, the tides would def definitely come in and be, you know, more feasible for people wanting to swim or boat or do whatever. I believe, I believe it does have something to do with the RV park there, that when they built that out and put the rock break wall, I think that's when it had a big effect on it. 
Anyways, I'm sure that uh, the staff can look at a few of those things because I think it's a great business to have down there. It's an important one, so we should try to help you out. Well, we had a lot of really good feedback, which was fun. Yeah. It was encouraging. A lot of people uh, enjoyed that. And um, as I said in my report, I was so amazed because I'm running around doing all the other tours elsewhere that I was so amazed at how well and how busy that um, community beach is. There was just, it was just rocking all summer. It was amazing. But I just need to get people down to the end. Understood. Councillor Powell. Thank you, Worship. I believe the sandbar would have to be dealt with with the federal government, oceans and fisheries. I know at one time we used to dig it out, but correct me if I'm wrong, to the Director of Operations. Uh, my understanding on that is that basically uh, it is would be considered within the title zone, so there's a number of um, hurdles to go through in terms of regulatory requirements. It's navigable, navigable water, easy for me to say. Um, there's also, it would require environmental assessments. It's within a wildlife management area. It, there is uh, fishery habitat considerations as well. I know when we looked at the Green Shore project a number of years ago, that was something we looked at, but because of those uh, considerations, along with the fact that it, the environmental assessment would also have to take into consideration, uh, like Councillor Greer was mentioning, about the impact that that would have on the remainder of the, um, of the shorelines as well. And one of the things I wanted to speak about, because I, I too read your, uh, what you provided, the report, and you talked about the labyrinth, and then some green space or something you wanted to use instead? Well, what happened is that when the labyrinth did go in early, um, I couldn't use the hovercraft site anymore, mm -hmm. and so we kind of moved off to the side where the, it's, um, uh, there's a fence there, and there's a bit of a green space, and there's a, um, park bench Did and we were work? kind of pushed over to the corner and so I would need to... So that wasn't the best solution. Well, it was um, in one way it was good because people from farther down the beach could see us but but our scope um, was definitely yeah. okay. hindered and so we would need to, I went down in January to look again to see how we could make that work to be a little more visible down there mm -hmm. as people are going around the the corner so that would be included too in the report from staff options. you could certainly uh, ask for a whole series of options council of faith thank you worship and thank you very much for your presentation it's, it's not often that we get a presentation that's this comprehensive and I, I agree with the mayor I'd certainly like to take your recommendations and ask staff to come back with it with a report but it's a very a very thorough report uh, I have the same comment as uh, councillor Powell uh, I with regards to the uh, the uh, gravel bar that's that's not within the city's purview that's going to be a fisheries and oceans as well as probably the environment the Ministry of the Environment so that and I I doubt very much that they're they do much to uh, to alleviate that problem I think they're letting nature take its course but but other than that I, I congratulate you on your report and I'll, I, you. I or somebody else will make a recommendation at staff uh, get back to you. It's, it's going to be easy for staff because you've listed all the things that you want. So, Thank you. I'll let the record reflect it's going to be easy for you, staff. <laughs> all right. Carrying forward, Councillor Newfell. <laughs> thanks very much, Jan. Thanks very much for the uh, presentation. It uh, looked very good. Uh, with respect to uh, the summer that you had, not asking for profitability or anything like that, but uh, you're, you're actually looking to come back again, I would hope. Uh, I am. This, this is something that uh, you want to do and you just want to clarify some of the issues and, and that's what you're doing here tonight. Exactly. Um, okay. Is there anything else uh, that you would like to see uh, staff deal with or, or uh, is, other than what you're coming up with here? I, uh, well, one of the biggest things is um, it was quite a laborious challenge, as I mentioned there, to uh, bring down all the boats, all the gear, set up, tear down every night. Um, it just took so much time, and I know that um, I could not have a permanent structure down there, but if this does go along and becomes something that is viable, and I think I've got some ideas on my own how to increase, I mean, it was definitely a pilot year and challenging, but it would be nice, as they do have at Qualicum Beach, to have some kind of structure where I could just leave all the boats and the gear, you just open the door, bring them out, you're set up every day. 
because that was that was huge having to do that and I you know that very first day I did put up a gazebo and then the next day I came and it was gone so um, and I knew that I knew we talked about security issues and things like that but that would be awesome if I had something where I could actually just have more of a structure down there but now with the labyrinth, labyrinth there I'm not sure how that all can work but that would certainly be huge you mentioned in your report some sort of a portable trailer perhaps is one option <clears throat> that obviously you could secure in some form or fashion yes. for overnight. Yeah. Okay. Follow up? If, you, if I could, Your Worship, please. Um, I don't know if this would be something for staff to look at, uh, but would it be possible for uh, you to have a trailer set up that, that, that you could actually move off of the site wherever you're going to be and leave it? Uh, in the um, um, we have a parking lot there it would take up possibly one space something of that nature that you could then pull back and, and uh, make use of of the, of the trailer uh, but I mean it would be a matter of uh, being able to secure all of the uh, material that's the biggest thing is being able to secure it all, I, all, all I'm suggesting is how to make the the, the enterprise <laughs> profitable and and uh, 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 something that, that I would like to see occur uh, as far as the beach is concerned yes yes Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Powell Davidson. You know, now would be a great uh, time for a motion if uh, you were interested in doing so. To I would like to make a motion. And I would also just like to ask a quick question through you Do to Do that staff. first and then make the motion, sure. Um, I seem to recall in one of our reports that the, con the concession building in the community park was uh, slated to be redone at some point in the future. Is that accurate? So, uh, so it could in getting fact an indication, yes, that is accurate, it absolutely, in it's in our budget. <laughs> That's what it's I'm getting at. could be one possible okay. option, I presume. And I would like to make the motion that we send this report back to staff for exploring some options, come back and present to us on it. All right, so that's been moved and uh, seconded by Council so Lefebvre. Do we require any discussion on that motion? All right, seeing no hands, I'll call it. All in favour? That's carried. All right, very good, Ms. Kratz. We'll uh, have some more answers and a little bit more exploration. Thank you. All right, we're moving right along, ladies and gentlemen. We are now into our correspondence section. We have item 4A from the Grumpy Old Men Hockey Club. I assume you're a member, Councillor Greer? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> All right, very good. And this is regarding... Uh, <laughs> this is regarding a fundraising tournament events for the Society of Organized Services. There is a recommendation to receive and I'm um, looking to council. So I see a motion to receive, seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. Any discussion on the motion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Okay, moving into reports. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we can at times, uh, assuming that there's uh, no major objection from council, move reports in a block in the interest of saving time and certainly in circumstances where they are relatively benign and or repetitive. It's wonderful that we have so many special event applications and... Uh, Certainly, I think uh, that's a, a sign that bodes well. However, I believe Councillor Morrison wished to make a motion to uh, ultimately move items A, B, C, D, E, and, e and F. Uh, and uh, is there a seconder for that motion? Seconded by Councillor Greer. Now, is there any member of council that wishes to speak to any of those individual items or indicate a uh, opposition to? Councillor Powell-Davidson. Uh, neither, Your Worship. I just want to go through you to our to uh, Mr. Metcalf, our Director of Operations. Have I got the title right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> and ask him a quick question, if I, question if I may. Go for it. Uh, Mr. Metcalf, do you see any reason why we should pull any? Of, do you have any concerns with any of these event applications? Are there any ones that you need to give us additional information on, or as far as you're concerned, we're good to pass them all through as one block? Mr. Metcalf, through Your Worship. Um, there are, we don't have any specific concerns with any of these. Um, just to answer an earlier question, all of our special events are 
uh, referred to and reviewed by both the RCMP uh, as well as the fire department. And all of these events have been, uh, there have been no objections from them as well on any of these events. All right, very good. Any further questions or comments on that? Okay, I'll call it. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. So that's good for you, sir, and thank you again for that uh, presentation. And the only comment I would make, it's great to see the Friends of Foster Park with the uh, Easter and both pumpkin and walk back on the agenda. So uh, that's wonderful. Moving on then to item G, and this one is from the Director of Finance. It's regarding the 2014 sanitary sewer utility rates. And uh, Mr. Butterworth, could you give us the background on this, please? Yes, Your Worship. Um, the sanitary sewage billings are based on water consumption and reductions in our water usage from water conservation efforts over the last few years. Um, the sewage capital program and combined with only one rate increase in the last six years has uh, reduced the annual revenues for the sewer fund and is also now eroding the accumulated surplus. Um, the reason there was no uh, increases over only one increase in the last six years is we had a fairly we have still have a fairly healthy surplus in there, but the capital program uh, over the next five to ten years uh, will erode that away. So the accumulated surplus uh, dips below 500,000 in 2018 in our recent DCC plan, which has has been before council and received three readings. The DCC plan and our draft provisional budget for 2014 to 18 both included a 6% increase uh, in the sewer rates for 2014. So the recommendation is as per the agenda. Okay, so we do have a recommendation there before us and uh, is a member of council prepared to make that a motion? Moved by Councillor Lefebvre, seconded by Councillor Morrison and uh, discussion on the now motion. Go ahead, Councillor Lefebvre. Very, thank you, Worship. Just very briefly, uh, as your representative on the RDN, we are looking uh, in the 2014 budget at uh, future projects, and this uh, this uh, sewer uh, uh, fund, uh, plant that's in the in the French Creek area is going to be expanded, and as as the Director of Finance has pointed out, it's going to become more costly over the years. So I, I can I can understand the, the rationale behind this, and I'm fully supportive. Other members of council, Councillor Newfell. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I have a bit of a problem with it in that um, uh, uh, as far as our uh, DCCs were concerned, um, uh, council decided that uh, we would only have a 1% increase with respect to uh, the DCCs, whereas the uh, Finance Department had suggested last uh, July uh, an increase of 45%. Um, as that would have had an impact uh, significantly on the um, uh, amount of dollars available for our capital expenditures for the, the uh, development uh, concerns as far as cost is concerned. I, uh, I, I uh, was unable to vote uh, uh, with council and, and voted against the, uh, the DCCs of the 1% uh, increase and, and uh, I can't support this. This is basically um, uh, something that is contingent upon other decisions that have been made and, and I, I cannot see how uh, we can uh, continue to, to uh, tax the uh, taxpayer uh, uh, beyond uh, his uh, ability to uh, succeed. Um, I, I look at this and say uh, uh, we, are, we are increasing costs and taxes all the time and, and uh, uh, there's a, a, a situation where I'm not willing to um, uh, support this, uh, this uh, suggestion of, of a 6% increase. We will have to increase um, uh, the rates, uh, and I acknowledge that uh, uh, monies will have to be expended, uh, but it uh, is going to be done on the, ba uh, the, the backs of the taxpayer, uh, who will benefit, uh, but also on, on uh, uh, it, it will benefit the uh, uh, developer and also the developer, uh, the um, people that will be coming in. And, and so I will uh, not be supporting this uh, the 6% increase. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Neufeld. Uh, one comment I would just make uh, with respect to the DCC bylaw, you referenced uh, that uh, increase that I think you're referencing there is making the assumption, of course, of a significant federal provincial contribution. If that contribution isn't realized, uh, I would 
expect DCC rates would climb significantly higher. Um, one other uh, question, which was one that was raised at the beginning of the meeting, and I promised to bring that forward, and, and I believe that was more specific to water, but as you see from the report, there is an association, and I was going to ask you, Mr. Butterworth, uh, just to how you go about making uh, the reviews that you do to determine ultimately what our water rate should be and maybe touch on sort of the factors that are involved in that. Uh, so you're referring to the water rates? Well, uh, yes sewer? and no. I mean, you heard the question at the beginning of the meeting. Yes. It wasn't technically part of the agenda, but uh, it is uh, touched on in here, at least in the sense that the uh, water rates do ultimately impact sewage. So. Uh, how do you go about that, sir? Right. Um, the first of all, just to deal with the review that he was talking about, um, we haven't done a formal review. I'd have to actually go back and look at the recommendation and see what was in it because I wasn't aware of the, that we were supposed to be doing a review with that. So we haven't done that formal re review, but I will look back and see what the recommendation said and, uh, right, very and report good. back on that to council uh, once I find out exactly what it says and what we were obligated to do. Um, what we do do, or what we what we did do uh, prior to um, the water rate increase that's in later on in the agenda here is um, we did review our water revenues for last year uh, and compare how what our model um, that we brought forward to council the year before looked like, and they were fairly close. Um, I think there's uh, between I think it's around a hundred thousand dollar difference between the two, so it's actually uh, fairly close on on uh, multi-million dollar revenues. Um, but as far as setting the rates, we do have a 20-year model and, and within the 20-year model, we have capital, um, all of our capital, all of our DCC funding, um, all of our expected operating costs, and we also have then uh, variables such as rates, which um, the, the water rates is generally what will uh, dictate how high the revenues will be and that ultimately pays for everything on top of the development contributions from DCCs and any grants we might have. Um, so the model basically puts it all together and we, we put in the rates. Um, we try and have consistent rates if we can all the way across. We start with say a 3% rate and see where that leaves us and if we end up being short in the model in some years then we have to make adjustments on the rates and either increase them or decrease them at the start of the, the plan or, or decrease them uh, in the case of the sewer fund, we didn't have any increases for five years in a row there because we had uh, fairly healthy surpluses and even going out a long ways, uh, they were still going to be okay. Um, but as I said, with the erosion of the rates, uh, the revenues, because of the decrease in water, which actually ultimately decreased the sewer rates, we're ending up now where we do have to have sewer rate increases and slightly higher than what we would like to have had. But um, those factors and the fact that actually development is slower than, than we had anticipated as well over the last few years has uh, necessitated a higher than normal increase for the sewer rates this time. It's a little bit of a cruel irony that uh, we, we press very hard for conservation and rightfully so just by virtue of the need to preserve and uh, in doing so of course we reduce our own revenues. And then ultimately we have to go back and look at rates because we do have to maintain uh, an adequate reserve. And that's certainly been the policy of the city for as long as I think the city's been here. So, All right, uh, I see Councillor Lefebvre and then Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to follow up on the comments that I made with regards to the uh, future planning that's being done at the RDN level that the Director of Finance is aware of. And I should point out that uh, in, in the financial planning and, and the and the cost of the upgrades and the expansion of the uh, sewage treatment plant uh, is going to be costly. Uh, this is a, um, this, this type of budgeting, uh, I think that uh, we take a cue from uh, our CAO, this type of budgeting is the worst case scenario, but there are, there will be um, applications made for grants at that time and th there could be adjustments uh, made as, as time goes by. But uh, you know, it's the old, the old uh, Fram filter ad, you pay now or you pay later. And the problem is when you pay later, you pay a lot more if you're not prepared for it. So uh, that's the situation we find ourselves in. And, but there will be, uh, I can say on behalf of uh, the RDN staff, and uh, I know that uh, our staff are aware of that, there will be, a, there will be a grant applica applications made for the expansion and upgrade of, the, uh, of, the, of that sewage treatment facility. All right, thank you for the heads up on that. Councillor Lefebvre, Councillor Greer, and then Councillor Powell. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I certainly agree with the 6% increase because these are our responsibilities as far as infrastructure go. And this is what I've been saying, I guess, for the last five years about having an austerity program because the more we spend, the more we're going to have to put ta water up, sewers up, taxes up. And I think that's our, that's our main goal here is to uh, do what we can to save money and maybe raise extra money so that we can look after infrastructure because that's the most important. That's our mandate. Our mandate isn't to do a lot of other things that we've been doing and I think we have to be more conscious of where we spend our money. But uh, this is what happens when you don't have enough money in your, in, in your um, kitty that you have to put up these rates and we've been continually putting up rates from day one so um, but we have to do it thanks and uh, in this case it's been five years since there's been an increase go ahead councillor Powell thank you your worship I'd just like to clarify and add some clarity to the discussion about the report on November 5th of 2012 I did receive a an email from a constituent and they were they were concerned because during that it was November 5th and I don't think, I did look up the motion on uh, the website earlier today and the motion doesn't direct staff to do a review in a year. But during the discussion, it was uh, brought to our attention that a review would be conducted in a year and it would be posted on the website. There was no direction from council. And so I think that's part of the confusion. Um, I agree with Councillor Neufeld in that this is directly connected to the DCCs and I spoke at the last meeting that I do not support um, option five and option five is based on getting eight million dollars in grants. There's 22 billion dollar grants coming out from the federal government right now. Uh, we had an earlier discussion. It sounds like most of that money's already taken by big cities. Um, I think it's not fiscally responsible to go with the biggest option. And while I heard what the mayor said about if it doesn't work, we can change it in a year, I'm not comfortable with that. It's harder to claw that back and it's gonna be just as hard to raise those rates. I think we should have done with option three at least or waited for a year to find out if we did get the, the grants or not. I do have a question. The 32.4% that was raised by uh, Mr. Pastor, did we get that from the commercial users in that option six and the water rates, do you know? Mr. Butterworth? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Your Worship, through you to the councillor. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that because I haven't done a, an overall review of the split between the commercial and the residential for last year, so we'll have to look at that and find out what the, how the ended up split ended up for the year with new rates. Go ahead, follow up, Councillor Powell. So are you gonna, do we need a motion from council to direct that or can it just happen? Well, I think uh, if it's something you want to ensure occurs and there's no confusion, you would likely want to bring forward a motion, but of course we've got to complete this motion first. Yeah. All right, any other members of council wish to speak to this item? All right, I'll call it then. All in favor? Opposed? <laughs> and that's carried. Thank you. All right, moving on to item H, and this is for Mr. Russell to give us background on the issue of a review of our accessory carriage house regulatory policies. Go ahead, Mr. Russell. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, sorry, here's me. I've got set up for a second. So at the November uh, 4th, 2013 Council meeting, Council passed a motion that staff be directed to review the City's policies on carriage house and provide options and recommendations for Council's consideration. So a um, little history, the carriage house uh, provision in the zoning bylaw uh, dates back a number of years, going back to 2007 and 2008. And it was really um, at the time envisioned to be a way to provide um, more affordable or rental opportunities um, within the city. And the city has been fairly progressive for a number of years having um, secondary suites um, permitted in the basement of existing dwellings. And basically this was in a sense is a secondary suite that's in a detached um, building. 
Um, I wanted to show a couple photos here just because um, I think long term we'll probably rename carriage house. It, it sort of suggests that you have to have a garage. Um, for clarification, you don't need cars parked below it. It can be a one story structure um, or it can be a number of different configurations. So this, this is the current RS1 zone. Um, there's a number of setback requirements and heights uh, for, for this zone. Um, right now there's a, actually for a single family dwelling or an accessory carriage house, um, from the rear lot line under the RS1 zone, there's a three meter setback. Um, if, it, if it's an accessory building like a storage shed, it's 1.2 meters. So currently the, the setback for both single family dwellings and accessory carriage houses is actually pretty much the same. Um, and in fact, actually under the existing zoning bylaw to the side lot line, the accessory carriage house has a, a more strict three meter setback versus the standard 1.6. Um, there has been, um, my understanding is there's been some expression to council recently with respect to um, rear lot line setbacks and um, particularly two, two story heights um, in proximity to the rear lot line setback. Um, there's a couple options that have been presented to council as far as potential amendments uh, to the zoning bylaw if council um, believes that there are um, you know, strong concerns with it. One would be to basically sort of step the height of the building as it gets into proximity to the rear lot line. So option one uh, in the staff proposal is basically increasing, um, let me rephrase this slightly, um, where the building exceeds four meters in height, it has to be at least six meters from the rear lot line versus the present three meters. Where the building is four meters or less, um, which is basically roughly 13 uh, feet, which is a one-story building, then it's allowed, it would be allowed to have the existing uh, three-meter setback. I'm going to kind of show you, this is just another option. Um, this would be to just to change the setback pretty much to six meters for both carriage houses and um, single-family dwellings. But I'm going to kind of show you, and excuse our high-tech drawing here, but um, <laughs> I was going to call it, uh, this is our CAD system or uh, crayons and doodles, I would call it. But anyway, so um, if we do a bit of the math here, and I apologize if there's any quick errors, but our minimum parcel size is 560 square meters. That's roughly uh, 6,028 square feet. Under our zoning bylaw, you're allowed a maximum parcel coverage of 33%. If you were to build a one story home on, the, on a lot that happens to be at the smallest side allowed, you'd max out at uh, 19,089 square feet. So you'd basically be able to put a just under 2,000 square foot home on the property and that would be it. No carriage house, no garage, nothing like that. Um, if someone wanted to build a single family house and a single family uh, carriage house or accessory building on their property, the house size is in this sense now being reduced to 1,500 square feet and the, the carriage house would be about 489. So a little bit under 500. Um, there are other options. The zoning bylaw does allow for, for two-story homes and that's across citywide. Um, someone could build a 2,000 square foot two-story house. Um, the average house size in Canada is presently about 1,900 square feet. That's the average house size in Canada. It may be trending down, but currently that's about, about the average. Um, so this is a scenario where you'd have a, carriage, a single family house at 2,000 square feet and the 90 square meter or 968 square foot uh, carriage house. Now you can see this, this would be a setback at three meters. There's still some yard here, um, but not a whole lot. If you were to advance this building to the six meter line, um, there wouldn't be a yard really at all. Um, this is, this is showing a two-story house with a two-story carriage house. Um, with, this is at six meters. Um, it still it, it increases the separation to the adjacent pro to the property to the rear. It also still provides some yard space. And this is kind of probably what people are more, more typically envisioning. This is where it's sort of a side-by-side -side scenario. The reality is to have a side-by-side -side scenario, you're really looking at a larger lot. You're looking at a lot that's at least, um, by my calculations, uh, 751 square meters. Um, this would allow for a 2,000 square foot home as well as a carriage house, 
uh, facing the, the site as your roadway. I, d I do want to backpedal slightly though. I in these scenarios here, under on a smaller lot, these would really primarily work kind of on a corner lot or a lot with lane access at the back. Um, so what's on the ground to date? So since it was implemented in 2008, there's been 11 carriage house building permits issued in the city. As we can see by the parcel sizes, people that are choosing to, to implement carriage houses are, are generally doing it on lots um, bigger than the 560 square meter minimum. Oops, Go back here. Um, and in fact, in most, they're even bigger than the 751 square meter example that, that was provided. In the majority of cases, they, because the lots are significantly larger, they have done that sort of side-by-side -side scenario. And in most cases, they've, they've far exceeded um, the setback requirements. There's probably only three um, that would be impacted by the, by the proposed change. Um, and only where it's a two-story. So I guess we have out of the three that were issued to date that would be impacted, only two of them would actually be impacted because one of them was a single story. So that's pretty much my summary. All right, thank you, Mr. Russell. And I see that you're making a recommendation, uh, and that recommendation beyond receiving this for information is to look at a draft bylaw with option one. Can you speak just to option one very quickly? Um, I'm recommending option one if, if council is of the opinion that the concerns are such that um, there is a need to address the matter. It's, it's not a strong recommendation, but it is a recommendation if council believes there, there is, is concern in the community. So definitely an option for council to consider, and that would be essentially to reduce heights to ensure that carriage houses are only single story in height. If I may clarify, Your Worship, it would be to reduce the height within, within the six meters to only one story within that six meter area. Right, okay. So we do have a recommendation before us, and I'm looking to council for some direction here. Councillor Powell. Thank you, Worship. I did read the report, and it's my understanding that uh, this is coming forward because there's not much in the bylaw now to govern the distance and everything for carriage houses. Is that correct? And this would clarify it? Mr. Russell? If I may, Worship, um, my understanding is, well, a couple things. Um, first of all, we do have a three-meter setback um, for both the single-family dwellings and carriage houses from the rear lot line. The present um, bylaw allows for up to two stories within that three meter distance. My understanding is the city and council particularly received some concerns with respect to a two story carriage house um, that was three meters from the property line. So what the proposed option one does is um, basically if, if your building is within six meters or less from the property line, it, its height is reduced to, to a one story height of four meters uh, versus the current seven and a half. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, I think Councillor Fave was first at it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. And thank you, um, Mr. Russell, for the presentation. Uh, two questions. Um, did we get any feedback from the construction industry at all on, on, this, on this proposal? If I may, Your Worship, um, that would happen as part of the bylaw review. We, we'd have a formal public okay. hearing where okay. input could be presented. But no, no initial reaction so far? There has been no referrals to date. Is it, is this it, is only to start that yeah, process okay. and then hear from the community. Is it, uh, is it safe to assume that parking might be a problem uh, with, this, with this option? Reduce and remove the carriage component of the carriage house? In other words, would we incur or would we encourage street parking if this were to be the case? If I may, Worship, I don't believe this encourages or discourages parking. It just makes it, at the end of the day, it makes it a little more challenging to fit carriage houses on smaller lots. Um, the bylaw is designed to kind of, the bylaw basically throws you a break. It allows you not to count um, the area where you park vehicles towards your, your overall floor area. So um, in a sense, you kind of get that space for free. It encourages people to screen their vehicles within a building. Um, it, it does, that's obviously e easier to achieve where, where you have a two-story format because then you can tuck the, the garages underneath. Um, so it does, it may impact the, the ability to easily screen vehicles on those smaller lots where it's getting a little tighter, but um, it doesn't mean you wouldn't be able to park cars on the property, it just means they're less likely to be screened within a building. All right, I think we'll move on down. I'll go ahead, Councillor Paul <laughs> Davidson, then Councillor Newfell. Thank you, Your Worship, and thanks for the presentation. Um, 
I do recall the, the, the person that had the concern about this and, and how we were, you know, basically caused us to review this, this whole bylaw. And, and the, the concern that the person had was that by having the two-story up against the fence, they were going to be viewing into their backyard. So my question to you is, if, if it's a two-story and somebody's upstairs, will they still be able to view in the yard of the person behind them whether they are three feet, three meters or six meters from the fence? Will they still be able to look into that backyard? Mr. Russell. They could conceivably. I, you know, personally, I, myself, I'm not looking out my window, looking at my neighbor's house a lot. So, you know, I don't know. I, I actually don't envision people do that. But um, at the end of the day, there, there really is no way short of eliminating uh, the provision for carriage houses to to achieve that. And then, under the same token, someone could be sitting in their existing single-family dwelling, doing the same thing. So. Um, I believe it may alleviate some of those privacy, privacy concerns, but can it eliminate it entirely? I don't believe so. But ultimately, you could simply build a two-story house, which is provided citywide, right? And then you have a second story. Okay. Councillor Newfeld. Thanks very much, Your Worship. Um, I was not able to find the def definition of what a, a carriage house is, uh, and I, I don't know if, if we have one. Is, is there one available, Mr. Russell? Mr. Russell. If I may, Your Worship, it is defined in the zoning bylaw. It's under the, in Division 100. I can, if, I, if this thing has internet access, we can probably bring it up. But at the end of the day, it's basically a secondary dwelling. Um, let's ah. I can do my best here to navigate. Uh, council bears with me. There, there is definitely a definition of it. And again, it doesn't require that you have a garage contained in it. As I said, long term, I actually think it should be renamed. But in the in the time frame, at the moment, until we do a full bylaw review, um, I'm not suggesting that change at this moment. And did, while you're doing that, in the very big picture, just going back a little bit, it, there's always been a desire expressed in our policies to provide a diversity of housing, especially in areas where. Uh, we can provide perhaps lower cost housing. I was at a recent meeting and uh, I, I can't verify the stats, but there was a stat there that uh, suggested that within certainly outside of the Capital Regional District, within Duncan to Campbell River, I think Parksville has the lowest vacancy rates at about less than 1%. And that's obviously a, a tremendous concern if our goal is to draw young people here and provide them with some sort of housing. So really carriage houses uh, and suites and, and making it easier to legalize your suite are all part and parcel of a general policy to try and diversify housing. If I can follow up on that, uh, Your Worship. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I fully agree with the, the concept of using carriage houses. Uh, one of the things that uh, I have done is, is I've actually pulled off uh, the, the and if, if you could just pass it around, uh, a definition of, uh, of a carriage house uh, from uh, Thearsis, and, and in fact, I've lived in carriage houses in, in uh, when I was going to school in Waterloo. Uh, the carriage house that I lived in was uh, the conversion of, a, of a, uh, a carriage house of a garage into a two-bedroom apartment, uh, and, and uh, it was, in fact, a, a manse, and in fact, it provided an income for uh, an impoverished uh, uh, United Church uh, uh, clergyman and and uh, so I, I, I had you know the experience of, of living in a, a carriage house I know what they're about I've seen them in Britain as well and I have friends that uh, that own carriage houses and rent them out so I know what a carriage house is and that's why I wanted to see what the definition was I'm sorry I, I, I didn't see it uh, prior to this Mr. Uh, Russell have you found the definition I have okay. I'll, I'll read it okay. out if you'd like so, so if I could just read it out an accessory carriage house means a dwelling which is uh, uh, contained in a building separate from a uh, separate family dwelling on the same lot and which is intended as a fixed place, place of uh, accommodation and home life. The interesting thing is that a carriage house by definition though, as, as I've chatted with, with various people around the, the community, uh, is normally a conversion. Uh, in, in your case, uh, with the 11 you put up, there was only one conversion of, uh, of the 11. The um, uh, situation is always the, the accessibility 
uh, either through a laneway or through uh, the ability to, to get into it to service it as far as uh, fire and safety is concerned. And uh, in, in the instance that we have before us um, uh, within the city, there is a, a problem with um, uh, access to uh, uh, fire suppression uh, or for um, uh, police, uh, police work. Now, um, part of this is, is, is due to the fact that it is not in, in this terminology that you have in front of you uh, uh, accessible as far as a, a laneway or uh, uh, through a, uh, a driveway system. Um, and I, I guess I, I look at it and I, I say, uh, uh, you know, I think we have to define exactly what we mean by a carriage house a little more clearly. And, and given that uh, you're suggesting that um, uh, if it's close to uh, setbacks and this type of thing, it, it can only be uh, one level, uh, I think it's uh, important to, uh, to put that uh, and, and state that uh, very clearly up front. And I would suggest as well that we uh, rename uh, this accessibility, at least this uh, accessory building, and not call it a carriage house, but in fact call it a secondary uh, suite or secondary building uh, on, the, on the lot line, uh, unless on the lot. And it, to what, to what extent is, I would ask Mr. Russell, to what extent is that going to affect um, the, the actual coverage? Uh, does it uh, impact at all uh, if you have a second family unit uh, on, the, uh, on the lot? It's Mr. Actually, Russell? If I may, Worship, it's actually all contemplated in the current zone. So the maximum lot coverage that you're allowed for all buildings is 33%. If you choose to cover your lot with 20% as your dwelling unit, then you're allowed the remaining 13% um, towards your accessory carriage house. Um, the accessory carriage house is, our, is maxed out as well at a maximum of 90 square meters, which is, I think, 986 square feet. So there are maximums already provided for in the zoning bylaw. All right, thank you. Moving on, Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't think the discussion here tonight is of what a carriage house is. I think it was, we had, I think, I believe only one complaint about the height of a building that overlooked uh, the backyard and the house of another building. And uh, I don't see anything wrong with our present status quo at all. And I think by moving it three meters and allowing the second story, I still think you'd be able to see into the neighbor's yard. And in many, many houses now, even a single dwelling or a single floor, uh, you can see into your neighbor's house if you want to be looking through the windows. So I, I don't see why we're jumping through hoops and barrels over, over one complaint. We had only had 11, I think you said, and they were all on very, very large lots and there were, there were absolutely no problems. So I think we might be making a mountain out of a mohill here. Thank you. All right, Councillor Greer. Uh, Councillor Powell-Davidson. Thank you, Your Worship, and um, my sentiments exactly, Mr. Councilor Greer. Two questions. How do we come up with six meters? Why not four or five? And how small can a carriage house be? Mr. Russell? Okay. <laughs> um, as far as the six meters go, it's actually our setback for apartment buildings, for three-story apartment buildings. So that seemed like a reasonable number as a starting point. Um, it's also fairly similar to our, our front yard setback of seven and a half meters. So it, it kind of was to provide a framework. Um, it was really just simply just a matter of doubling the existing one. And the second question was? How small can a carriage house be? If I may, Worship, um, through the Councillor of uh, Powell Davidson, um, the bylaw itself doesn't regulate a minimum size. Those are basically ascribed under the BC Building Code. So a bedroom has to have a particular size, a kitchen has to have a particular size. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head and there's some design elements to those. Um, my guess would be probably in the kind of 250 to 300 square foot range, but again, it's, it's dictated by the BC Building Code, not by the zoning bylaw. All right, thank you, Mr. Russell. Go ahead, Councillor Fave. Your Worship, I'd like to move the motion as it's written so that we can get, move on and, and have, get some feedback uh, from, the, uh, from the community and the uh, Construction Association, that sort of thing, and see what, where this takes us. All right, so Councillor Fave has made the recommendation into a motion, and I understand Councillor Powell is seconding it. So on that motion now, is there any discussion from Council? Go ahead, Councillor Greer. Is the, is the motion calling for option one, or are you just... 
Yes, it is the recommendation to receive and then ultimately to move with option one. It would then go into a process where we would have some opportunity for further feedback before it's adopted. Further questions or comments on it? The only thing I would add, uh, just based on having some of these conversations, certainly with uh, the folks that were concerned in the immediate area, is that uh, you know when you move into a, a community uh, or rather a neighborhood and, and your houses are all already built, uh, it can sometimes jump at you as a bit of a surprise. It's a little different than moving in next to, say, an empty lot. Uh, you know, in terms of something suddenly appearing uh, that's higher than you might have anticipated. So that that was one thing that sort of tweaked me a little bit, but uh, I certainly hear both sides of this argument. Uh, no further comments from council? Questions? <coughs> I'll call it then. All in favor? Opposed? Let me call that one more time. All in favor? Opposed? Go ahead and raise your arms if you're opposed. All right, that is carried. That then takes us, I believe, into oh, our strategic plan. And uh, I want to give a little bit of background, but uh, as we've had quite lengthy discussions on this, and it's quite available there in the agenda to get a sense of what it's all about, I won't go into those details. But what I will say is that uh, you know, a strategic plan is really a reminder to us that there is a long-term approach at work here and that we are but one term of politicians that are working on what you would hope would be a consistent theme forward in order to maximize our efficiencies and our ability to grow and see our community flourish. And uh, with that, there is a recommendation to receive this report and ultimately then uh, to adopt the strategic priority themes as outlined on page six of that strategic planning process. And uh, do we have someone who's prepared to make that motion? Moved by Councillor Paul Davidson, and I believe that's a seconding from Councillor Morrison. Are there any discussions? Go ahead, Councillor Powell. Thank you, Worship. It's a technicality. I already discussed it with the CAO on environmental sustainability and economic sustainability. You have the same definition for both, but he assured me that on the website it was correct. All right, so you're assuring us all, Mr. CAO, that that is correct, and that was essentially just a, uh, a typo. <laughs> all right, very good. So any further questions or comments? I know there was some concern uh, about making sure economic development was a component of those themes. Are we satisfied in that regard? I think you raised that, Councillor Morrison. Okay. And uh, you had your hand up, Councillor Newfeld. Thanks very much, Your Worship. I look at this and, and uh, I get really ticked off with, with uh, how we're putting up that, uh, that uh, graph. Uh, because, in fact, I look at the environment and I look at the environment, and that's all that supports all of us, uh, whether it's social or, or uh, economic. Um, it's the environment that we have as far as uh, the oil that we take from the ground. It's the uh, environment as far as the, the air that we breathe. It's the, uh, the water that we, um, we utilize. It's the uh, forestry that we uh, utilize. It's the metals. It's all the environment is absolutely critical as far as uh, being sustained. And, and what, what happens is that we have... Uh, society, uh, as far as the, the numbers of people that are involved uh, in society, and we're growing all the time. We're up to uh, billions, seven billions uh, at this point. Um, and that's absolutely critical. Uh, and it's how we use uh, uh, the environment that is critical. Uh, so I, I, I look at uh, uh, the aspect of, of uh, societal growth and economic growth. And, and uh, at some point, we are, in fact, not going to be sustainable. Uh, so I, I look at the, the issue of sustainability as, as being really critical, and it's the environment that to sustains all of us, uh, whether it's, it's the social aspect or the economic aspect or the developmental aspect. And so I, I, I look at this uh, uh, theme as, or the, this vision as, as being uh, something uh, superfluous. I mean, it's the environment that is absolutely critical to, uh, to, to who we are and to what we're able to do. Um, I mean, this is what this is the the aspect as far as uh, um, the, the the primary theme is the enhancing the quality of life, 
And the, the environment is, is absolutely crucial, uh, and it supports all of us. Um, and so I, I look at how we, in fact, as far as a society, and, and how we use it economically. And in fact, we're degrading uh, the environment all of the time. And I, I'm sorry, I, I, I have problems with the, uh, the strategic uh, uh, planning uh, process that uh, has, been, has come forward here. And I, 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 I have read this a couple of times, and I've reread on the material that we were uh, previously given, and I, I really have some difficulty with it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Further comments, questions from members of council? Go ahead, Councillor Paul Davidson. Councillor Greer, or pardon me, through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Newfield, I have to respond to that. We've discussed this at great length many, many times. Um, I would have thought that your, your uh, reserves would have come in long before now. I'm very surprised because we had a big discussion on this, all of us, big input. And this is uh, what we've come up with. I'm surprised to hear you say it. Further comments from members of council? All right, I'll call it. All in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. Thank you. All right, moving along, ladies and gentlemen, we're now into our bylaws section. We have one bylaw for three readings tonight, and that is the Water Service System Amendment Bylaw 2014, number 1320.23. And... Uh, is there anyone wishing to uh, make that motion for three readings? Moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. Any discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Neufeld. Similar to the comments that I've given uh, uh, as far as the water, uh, at least the sewage treatment and, and various things, I'm taking a very negative uh, approach tonight, unfortunately. Uh, not that I plan to do so, but given the amount uh, uh, of... of uh, Increase from uh, the DCCs, which is one percent, um, and, and, and the problems that I, I uh, envision uh, uh, as far as the, the, the costing of, of uh, being able to provide the capital servicing of, of uh, those plants, um, I, I, I have a, a great difficulty. Uh, you know, I, I would like to see. I'd like to have seen the DCCs increase. I recognize, in looking at it, that in fact we are actually coming to. Uh, uh, something that I wanted in the very beginning where you had uh, the full statement of, of uh, uh, pricing across whether you were residential, large residential, fam large family, uh, consumer, uh, as far as uh, commercial, retail, and, and we're coming to the point of, of uh, increasing all of the rates to, to the same. Um, so in, in that sense, uh, going back to um, uh, October before I was elected, I made the point to um, uh, Mr. Manson, our CAO, that I thought all, all, all water should be uh, charged at the same rate, and I think we're coming to that. Um, so I, I think it's a beginning of, of uh, that system. I'm, I'm concerned about the amount of, of uh, charge, though, with respect to um, uh, the financing of the uh, water treatment plant, and that, that's the, the issue that I have. But otherwise, uh, I'm willing to support the, uh, the, this, uh, this amendment bylaw, and I, I, I like it, uh, but I still have some reservations concerning it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Further comments, questions? All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, so we're now moving into some of your favorite part of the meeting, which is new business. And uh, I think uh, I'm going to look around the table. Do we have members of council that have items for new business? So we have one, two, three. <laughs> you had to get your hand up there, didn't you, Councillor Lefebvre? So that's four. All right, sure. We'll start uh, with uh, Councillor Greer. And uh, go ahead, Councillor Greer. What do you have for us under new business like I don't already know? <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, it's, it's to do, of course, with grants and aid, and I've been bringing this up for the last six years, I guess, that the City of Parks will discontinue the annual spring and fall grant and aid program and the practice of providing financial assistance to groups and organizations with the exception of providing assistance for the Beach Festival and July 1st Canada celebrations, and that requests for financial assistance for the annual Beach Festival and July 1st Canada Day celebrations be considered each year prior to adoption of the final budget. 
And I take it you wish to make that a motion, sir? That is a motion. All right, so we need a seconder for it to get onto the table. I see a seconder in Councillor Neufeld, so it's now on the table. As a mover, do you want to speak to it again? Thank you, Worship. As I mentioned before, I've been trying to eliminate this program for over six years, and uh, it hasn't worked to this date. Um, I, I have found that most municipalities have done away with this program, in fact, many years ago. And we continue to, to give this money out, and it's not the matter of the $5,000. Over the six years, we've given out $30,000. And I can go on from there, where we've spent $145,000 over those six years uh, in, from our constituency fund. And I can go on further from there where we send a small fortune on subsidies, just to mention a few, the PCC billing at 1.5 million. This is really deficit financing. To balance a budget we are mandated to do, we have to raise taxes, and over the last six years we've raised them about 15%. And we're looking at a raise again this year. I don't think this is sustainable, and I think sooner or later we have to do away with some of these giveaway uh, money situations that people come on a weekly basis for. Spend <clears throat> I know our PQ News tells me we have to spend money to make money, but at the end of the day, we will be no better off than the school boards, ferry services, and the postal services, because eventually we're going to have to answer the bill and, and we won't have the money to do this, and I think it's time to start now. We continue to kick this same can down the road, and as we do so, I think the end of the road will come sooner or later. So I think we should be doing away with this. The, the groups that come for this money, they want $300, $400, $500, and I can assure you if the groups are worthwhile at all, they'll be able to raise that money on their own. It's not that I'm against any of these organizations. I just think that the people who benefit the most are the business people, and they're the ones that maybe should sponsor and, the, and put up the money for to bring business into the town. The guy that lives up at the end of Hearst Street, he couldn't care less about what these organizations do because he doesn't gain anything directly from it. And uh, I have a huge support in this issue. Uh, most people that I talk to, in fact, every person I talk to, really gets upset when, when we give money out on a weekly basis here at council meetings. Um, so I think we should be saving our money as uh, every which way and putting it into infrastructure. Just as we mentioned tonight, the sewer's up 6%, water's up 4%, and we can, can no longer be just giving away money. Uh, at the end of the day, it's going to cost us. And I think other communities have seen this. We've got an advisory committee that we, we put in charge of cutting back on our permissive taxes, and they did. So that was an initiative that we gave them. We've given them another initiative to raise money so we can have more revenues. And at the same time, we keep giving money away to organizations that come and make a presentation. So I would like council to really consider this and, um, and get rid of this uh, grant and aid program. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Greer. So uh, as a seconder, I'll give you the next opportunity, Councillor Neufeld. Thanks very much, Your Worship. Knowing that this was coming forward, I actually uh, had a discussion with uh, uh, the Beach Fest Society, and, and uh, we were talking about uh, the possible implication for, for them uh, as to whether they come forward with a uh, request for, uh, for money. I, I don't know that's going to be their decision to make. But uh, I, I did advise them that uh, money was becoming scarcer and that uh, I would probably be seconding a, a motion that uh, Councillor Greer has actually uh, just put forward. So uh, I, I look at it and, and I think about um, uh, the fact that uh, we have organizations within the community that are worthwhile, that, that uh, should be supported. And, and I, I, I don't uh, disagree with, uh, with, with the concept of, of helping uh, your neighbor. Uh, but as uh, Councillor Greer has suggested, um, you know, we also have to be um, uh, responsible to the uh, uh, to the larger community that uh, pays our salary and also uh, asks us to make decisions on their behalf. And, and uh, I don't know um, whether or not the grants and aid program is worthwhile. And I, I look at it and I think of the costs that uh, uh, Councillor Greer has uh, put forward. And I think that um, you know, he may have some very legitimate points with respect to uh, these events will benefit us. They're also benefiting uh, uh, the community at large, but they're also benefiting the, the, um, 
the shopkeepers that are benefiting, the uh, owners of, of uh, establishments within the community, and uh, you know, possibly it's a case that uh, uh, they should be supporting, those, those entrepreneurs should be supporting the, um, uh, the, the uh, events as they occur. Uh, the, the situation uh, with some of them uh, that are uh, charitable uh, uh, organizations that uh, one that uh, came into uh, uh, us two, uh, two weeks ago, uh, I, I in fact did uh, uh, support. Um, but again, uh, if we're going to uh, do it on a carte blanche basis, uh, then we, uh, we remove uh, grants and aid. However, st having stated that, I also had a, a brief discussion earlier with uh, Mr. Butterworth, and, and uh, so there, there are, it's a matter of, of how do we, in fact, make it uh, um, a, a, an issue. And, and at this point, I have s I've seconded the motion, and I'm, 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 I'm thinking of it. I'm, I'm uh, trying to figure out, you know, how I'm going to vote for it. But uh, it's a case that I think that we have to become uh, more physically responsible and, and deal with uh, uh, the, the allocation of monies. And, and that's the, the comment that I would make at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you. So who is next? Councillor Paul Davis and then Councillor Lefebvre. Thank you, Your Worship. I have to respond to a few things that Councillor Greer said. First of all, uh, the guy up on her street who doesn't gain anything from these events or their organizations, um, I would beg to differ with that. I think that everybody in this city will benefit from or has benefit from these organizations and the events that they put on, if not directly, then certainly indirectly. How about pride of community? How about the, surf the services and the structures that continue to be added that are not coming on taxpayers' backsides? How about the social wellness of a community? How about celebration of our own cultures? In, in, in response to the suggestion that the businesses should be uh, kicking in instead of the city, um, believe me, the businesses of the city of Parksville get hit on on a daily basis, and they do contribute big times to the organizations and the volunteer events that are put on. Um, I would say that we should, before we jump the gun about uh, discontinuing any grant and aid program or any kind of financial assistance that we give to our volunteer organizations, I'd like to put the question out there. Imagine the cost of running these organizations or putting on these events with, without the volunteers who put in the hours and hours. Imagine a community without these events and these organizations. Thank you. Councillor Lefebvre. Thank you, Your Worship. And um, I guess the problem I'm having, I've been on council now for 12 years, and I've got a bad cold to top it all off. And Councillor Greer, as he, as he mentioned in his opening statement, he's brought this forward now, what, six times, seven times? Uh, it's, it's, always, it's always been defeated, and Councillor Greer says he hears from all of these people in, in town that want us to cancel grants and aid. I've never had anybody, anybody come to me and say cancel, cancel, cancel grants and aid. Um, one, of the, one of the checks that I brought to the grants and aid program since I've been the city rep to the RDN is I have an arrangement with staff that w there are grants and aid provided at the RDN by the RDN, and I make sure that there's no double dipping, and I provide that to, to staff so that uh, if somebody's applying for a grant and aid in Parksville and they're applying a grant and they get a grant and aid in, uh, from the RDN, they don't, uh, they don't, get, uh, they don't get any more money. Um, I come back to the fact that uh, following up on, on what Councillor Powell Davison said, uh, the people that, the, the groups that come for this kind of a grant are small nonprofit groups and uh, the amounts, I've sat on the committee from time and time again, the amounts are $250, $500, And uh, to, to uh, a businessman, maybe that's not a lot of money, but for some of these nonprofit groups, that's the difference between being able to do things and being able to carry on and not being able to carry on. And as Councillor Powell Davidson said, uh, a lot of people go to the businesses. Businesses are very, very generous in Parksville. They give out a lot of money to a lot of organizations, uh, sports to name one, and uh, sometimes uh, they're like a lot of other people, they, they've got their limits. So I think that this does, um, uh, does a lot of good. It's $5,000 and I'm trying to figure out what the percentage means on $5,000 to the overall city of Parksville budget. It's probably, you know, it's probably so minuscule that it's probably the size of a molecule. 
So, um, you know, once again, I don't support it for those reasons that I've, that I've mentioned. And if I had somebody that, that has, in the last 12 years that has said to me, I want to get rid of grants and aid, I would have, I would have probably reacted, but it simply hasn't happened. So I won't be supporting the motion. Again. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Lefebvre. So, uh, Councillor Greer, the final word, and then we're going to call it. Yeah, I, I'd just like to answer. Um, it's not a matter of, of not wanting these organizations. My, my feeling is, and I think you missed the point, is that these organizations, they come here because it's easy to get $1,000 or whatever amount that they want. All I'm suggesting is that these organizations, if we didn't give it to them, would go out and raise the money. We would still have the events. We'd still have these organizations doing things. And as I've mentioned before, I've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars because I've been involved in so many groups and I've never once gone to the city for money because I've always been able to raise the money and you're right the business people do get hit up I've gone to business people in this town and they tell me I'm the fifth guy in the door this morning looking for money however I usually get the money but anyways um, it's not a matter of these organizations not existing they will exist but we just make it too easy for them and it's not just 5,000. As I said, it's 30,000 over the last five years. And uh, I, think, I think people um, do understand. I, the reason that you're not being asked about the grants and aid is because you've probably never brought the subject up. With all these things, I bring the subject up to a number of people, and I get the answer very clearly. So if you ask enough people, you'll get the answer that, that I've, I've received. So... Um, Anyways, I think it's worth considering, and I think as long as we're raising taxes and raising water rates and raising sewer rates, then we better cut some avenues in other areas. Thank you. All right, I think we've had a very, very good discussion, both sides of the fence on this, so let's call it. All those in favor of Councillor Greer's motion? All right, all those opposed? And that is defeated. Thank you. All right, so moving along then, I'm going to be going to the next person here that had an item for new business, and that was Councillor Powell. Thank you, Worship. I just go like I'd like to go back and make that motion uh, that we discussed earlier for the uh, water utility rates to direct staff, and maybe staff can fix this up, uh, to direct staff to do a review of the water rates that were adopted on November 5th, 2012 to determine the percentage of water use uh, that the residents pay versus commercial user base. And do you want it that specific? Let me ask Mr. Manson here, or I'll ask Mr. Butterworth at your direction, Mr. Manson. Do you think it's better to have a very, very specific review, or do you want to leave some latitude here and just come back and let us know about uh, a whole bunch of parameters? The, the specific review is fine. Um, if there's other parameters that we feel um, council should consider as well, we'll add them into it. All right, so with that, then you have a motion before council. Do we have a seconder for Councillor Powell's motion? Seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. <coughs> Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Moving on down the table, Councillor Lefebvre. Thank you, Worship. I sent everybody on February the 13th a, um, an email saying I would be bringing this motion up tonight. Do I read the motion, Your Worship? Yes? I'll take, I'll take that as a yes from the uh, executive, <laughs> executive director. Uh, the motion is that the City of Parksville support, support the joint application with the Town of Coalicum Beach for a healthy community's capacity grant of $18,000 to enable the Access Oceanside Association to continue their work in awareness, informing and educating the Oceanside community on creating age-friendly communities that promote active participation for all ages and ability levels, which is intended to prevent or avoid unnecessary institutionalization and greater use of healthcare resources. I think I said that wrong. Specific project objectives include updating and enhancing the accessibility resource guide and website designing and delivering awareness training programs and providing accessibility consultation services to the local health and service organizations, businesses, nonprofit agencies, and the general public in Oceanside. And I'd like to conclude, Your Worship, by saying to Councillor Greer that this is not asking for any money. This is going ahead and applying for grant money 
for the uh, for the Access Oceanside Association. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. I see Councillor Powell Davidson seconding. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. Again, Councillor Lefebvre? Well, I, on this one, Your Worship, I need some advice uh, through you to the CAO because I sent it to Council at approximately 9.23 last night. And I'm, perhaps uh, the CAO is going to suggest that I bring it up at, at the next Council meeting. Would that be more appropriate than bringing it up tonight? Okay. Let the record reflect the CEO is nodding his head. So you've all got that on your, um, on your, uh, you got that on your email, so I'd like you to consider it if you have any questions. Uh, it's asking for money. I, I know what Councillor Greer's answer is going to be, but uh, I'll talk more to it at the, next, at the next council meeting. All right, very good. Why don't we wait until it becomes before council and then we can discuss it. Okay, do you want I, I won't be here for the next council meeting. I still don't. I still don't think it'd be appropriate to discuss something that council hasn't even had an opportunity to digest since it only came in at 9:23. Why don't you well, make we all a looked at it. Why don't you make a written submission and I'll ensure it's part of the agenda for the meeting you're not going to be here on. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Moving on, councillor. Anyone still needs uh, an opportunity, councillor Paul Davids. Thank you, worship. Um, even though it's going to be hard for me to do this, I'll try to provide a very, very brief verbal report to, to Council. Um, last week, I attended the Local Government Leadership Academy um, conference in Vancouver, in Richmond, actually. And as you know, I took a few no's. <laughs> so I wrote virtually every single thing down that I attended. And I put that out to Council. I will prepare you a full report, um, more lengthy than I have time right now. The theme of the conference was Through the Looking Glass, Reflections on Leadership. And they talked about community, relationships, and self. So this was a really different conference. And, and wow, did I ever get a lot out of it. Um, we had Peter Wood, who was, is a mayor from Australia. He's also the ambassador for um, United Cities Local Government Asia Pacific. I don't know if you've heard of that or not. But he, I was talking to the mayor today about um, his presentation. Basically, he was reminding us that we are the government of the people. We are not the bottom of the hierarchy. We need to redefine ourselves and get back into an equal playing field, not waiting for the province or the feds but rather taking a bigger stand on behalf of the people. I really enjoyed his presentation. I'm anxious to share that with you. Um, we also heard from three young elected officials. Uh, their presentation was called A Fresh Perspective on Leadership. They talked about what they've learned in their first couple of years in local government, about bridging the divide, overcoming the old guard's way, and engaging youth. Um, we had a great chat from Greg Halseth. This was a community outreach program which was sharing stories from other municipalities throughout the province. And I want to draw your attention to a story that Colin Palmer, the chair of the Palver Regional, Direct, uh, Regional Board, talked about how every three months their council, city council, as well as their regional board, as well as their First Nations council, sit down and meet. They don't make any dis discussions. They just keep these lines of communication going and if there's anything to be discussed and decided then um, their their mayors and their leaders sit down and and talk about that further but I really liked this idea of, of engaging actually sitting down with all the um, very various councils that we share borders with or that we are partnerships with and having these discussions we had uh, George Cuff whom many of you will be familiar with he talked about um, relationships and more, most specifically good CAO council relationships. And I highly encourage you to go on the Local Government Leadership Academy website and read that presentation in its entirety. Um, just one of the things that really stood out for me, he went through in detail what a good CAO looks like. And I was just secretly clapping under the table because I was really pleased to see that our... Uh, our CEO, Mr. Manson, uh, certainly met the bill on everything that was being talked about. Conversely, other mayors and councillors in the room with me were busy t -t 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 complaining quietly amongst themselves about their own. So uh, just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Mr. Manson. We're pleased to have you with us. 
Um, Dr. Paul Kershaw was a fascinating presenter, and actually our good doctor that was here earlier made reference to um, government not investing in younger people, and we are beginning to feel the effects. This is really crucial. This is a report that I have written down in its entirety. Would love to share it with you. The m amount of money that our governments, our senior governments, have invested in seniors is great. It's really done its job in, in reducing senior poverty. Conversely, younger people are feeling the crunch. The housing prices are higher. They're working harder, making less money, and what they're giving up is either putting off having children or not having children at all. I know I sound like a bit of an alarmist, but this is a real serious situation. I, you know, I think that goes back to the first presentation that we attended to. It's uh, getting that voice, working together with our fellow councillors um, throughout the province, fellow councils rather, and um, looking to get government to put more money into younger people. It's 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 become a very serious issue, especially as we get more and more people moving into the senior categories in the, in the very short years ahead of us. Um, there were several other great presentations. Um, I just want to invite Council to check out a um, one idea that was talked about is fair share. Google that when you get a chance. This is uh, something that the Peace River region came up with. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it because there was so much information that we got. Check out also Jen's, uh, Jen's squeeze. That's in, ref in reference to the generation squeeze. There were several topics in regards to young people. And also check out, if you will, the new public hearing debate. We had a huge debate there. Apparently there's something new, and I don't have all my details handy, but I, I bet Mr. Manson knows about it, where public hearings are not now mandated. And we had a big debate on this at the LGLA. <laughs> You'd be pleased to know that most mayors and councillors felt that it should be maintained, but there's some new discussions out there where these are not mandatory anymore. All right, well, we'll look forward to the detailed report. Yes, and if, if my report detailed to you is not detailed enough, I happily copy all my notes and give them to you. Yeah, I'll give you more. Sure. Thanks. I will say this. Great conference. Councillor Paul Davidson, having attended many a conference with you, you're the last person anyone can say isn't there on behalf of the taxpayer, taking in the sessions very seriously. And yes, uh, I know you're the best note taker out of all of us. All right. Is there anything further from members of council? If not, I have a question for you. And then uh, I'll go ahead, Councillor Greer. But uh, let's keep this short. This will be short. Uh, I've been concerned recently about the parking um, beside the PCC building and so on. And I, I made a little motion here that uh, maybe I should put my glasses on so I can see what I wrote. That the city staff be directed to review the parking duration between the PCTC and the PCC for council's consideration. Um, it seems like I don't know who's using this parking lot, but um, I know in recent weeks uh, it has been totally filled. And I got the feeling that I don't know whether the school board's using it or who's using it, but somebody's parking there and they're parking there most of the day. So if the city, and apparently we, owe, uh, we have, what, 70% of the say in that parking lot? Is that right, Brian? Mr. Manson? Mr. If, Manson? I, if I wait, yeah, if I may, Your Worship, um, I'm sorry I woke you up there. I'm we're in a, a <laughs> joint venture relationship uh, with the ownership of this building, uh, ourselves, the uh, school district in Malaspina University College, oops, Vancouver Island University. It shows you how dated I am. Anyway, um, we're about a 70% owner. The school district, I think, is around 22. Uh, the college is the other uh, uh, eight. So all, all I'm suggesting is that our staff do a review and see what's happening there. So you're asking essentially, could you reread that motion real quick just so I'm clear? I, I didn't quite hear it entirely clearly. That the city staff be directed to review the parking duration between the PCTC and the PCC for councillors con council's consideration. Okay, so all right, uh, that is the motion then on the floor. Is there a seconder for that motion? <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. Maybe cough into your... Um, and uh, is there any discussion on that now motion on the floor? All right. All in favor? Opposed? All right. That's carried.
All right, we'll have a review, hopefully in time for your return. Councillor Greer. Good. No other members of council have any new business. Uh, I'm going to ask us in a moment to uh, go into special business. Before I do, and in the interest of time, I was going to talk a little bit further on this, but uh, I do need some direction from you as your mayor. And uh, as I'm beholden to you, I have been, as some of you are aware, uh, from being at a recent meeting, expressing some concern about uh, not just ourselves here, obviously, but about the island as a whole and about perhaps a need for uh, a better voice to represent us here on Vancouver Island. Uh, and this comes not just uh, of my own idea, but actually in some discussions that I've had with more than one fellow mayor. Uh, as Council is aware, we are going to be hosting the uh, Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities along with our partners in Qualicum Beach. And uh, as host communities, uh, you know, we have some opportunity to speak to those individuals that are coming and for anyone that may not know that's essentially all of Vancouver Island and the Sunshine Coast and uh, I'm suggesting out there that uh, it may be time for something along the lines of a mayor's caucus or a group that uh, can in a very specific way in a very simplified way with one common voice and one common objective in theory be able to advance the cause of this island. I won't get into all the details about what was said in the, the meeting because I think a number of you were there and I believe there's an article that captures it quite well uh, that will be coming out in tomorrow's paper. However, I do want to hear from members of council if any of you have a serious concern with that conversation because I don't want to uh, reflect poorly upon any of you if indeed uh, you do have concerns or at least I'd like a majority support. Councillor Paul Davidson. Thank you, Worship, and I can't tell you how pleased I am to hear you bring that suggestion up. That's exactly what we were talking about at the LGLA last week um, with Peter Wood, and I, I really want you to read my notes. <laughs> I will read your notes, as I always do. And I also have to add, Your Worship, um, there were a few of us at that meeting where you spoke last week, and, and that was really, really impressive, and it's about time we started to get working together as an island, as an entity, and put some more power behind our voice. I'm absolutely an, all in favor for this. All right. Well, that's good to hear. So I'm going to put you in the not concerned category, and um, go ahead, Councillor Powell. Thank you, Worship. I wasn't at the meeting where you spoke, but I did see it on Twitter, and I support you full heartedly. I think we're... We're missing out on Vancouver Island, and I th don't think it's fair, and it's time that somebody stood up and said, you know what, we're over here. So I'm really glad that you did that. All right, very good. You know, it's, uh, go ahead, Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I certainly am in favor of that as well. I think there has to be a lot of, a lot of pressure, not just a, a group of people or mayors, but I think uh, some other uh, important people maybe, but it, the pressure has to be put on big time or else nothing's going to happen because we are pretty well forgotten here. And I think the money uh, that uh, was given out in the federal uh, budget, I, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if it's all pretty well designated right now. So it's going to take some hard work and some real pressure to make things change. All right, thank you. So uh, I feel I have that mandate. Go ahead, Councillor Lefebvre, and then we'll move on to special business. Thank you, Worship. I think that um, I, I am supportive. The, um, some, of the, some of the key issues for Parksville, we're, tourism is a big, uh, big industry for us, and with what's happening with the ferries, I think we have to get, get, uh, get going on that, and, uh, because that's, that's impacting on tourism. The other, uh, the other our larger issues are infrastructure, and of course, uh, the thing that we've been talking about is the rail line. And uh, the, the, the attitude that's out there now with regards to the rail line is that $20 million will get the rail up and running. Well, $20 million won't get the rail up and running. We need $120 million to get the rail up and running. And let's, let's get the rails up and running. Let's get the big trucks off the road. Let's get uh, tourism and uh, freight transportation uh, as, a, as a key part of that. And um, let's, I think that the, the proper uh, organizations to opt for that and to, to fight for it is a caucus of mayors and regional districts that um, that are, our voices now are not uh, are not being heard and we're not we're not acting as as one cohesive unit. So, I think there's a lot of work to do, and there's an awful lot of uh, statistics out there, a lot of financial data that's going to show that uh, 
the, the economic impact if we don't get some of these things resolved, like the ferries and like the uh, like the rail transportation. All right. Thank you. Okay, let's move along then. We do have an item of special business this evening, and uh, I'm going to need a mover and a seconder that pursuant to Section 91C of the Community Charter, Council proceed to a closed meeting to consider items related to labor. And do we have that? Moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Powell. All in favor? Opposed? <coughs> carried. Let's take a five-minute bathroom outdoor fresh air break, and then we will come back. <laughs> <laughs> 